broken blues Climb the fence, books and pens I can tell that we are gonna be friends We'll continue uh, with the introduction of Mr. Arnold Amber. Mr. Arnold Amber is a longtime president of the Canadian Journalists for Free Expression, CJFE, which supports media rights and free expression in Canada as well as around the globe. Since 1992, CJFE has also managed the daily activities of uh, EFEX, the world's largest network of free expression advocates with more than 85 member organizations in every corner of the world. Mr. Amber's background is on political studies, and he has an extensive journalist career covering politics as well as the electoral processes in Canada and nine other countries. His foreign career includes several years as a staff correspondent for Reuters news agency in Africa as well as in Europe, multiple contributions to a number of leading international newspapers, broadcasters and magazines, and international assignments as a media trainer. His most complex and rewarding foreign training mission was in 1994, when Amber headed to a five-country international team, which directed South Africa's national public broadcaster and its coverage of the country's dramatic first-ever democratic elections. Much of Mr. Amber's journalist career was spent at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, where as an executive producer, he was the television news department. Uh, he won the National Gemini Award for producing the best television news special program of the year on three different occasions. His last two television assignments uh, were at the CBC, where as executive producer of the program Inside Media, as well as News World International, the CBC's former 24-hour, seven days a week, all news channel, which was aired in the United States, Mexico, as well as the Caribbean. Academically, Amber has been granted a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Ottawa and a Master's degree in Political Studies from Queen's University. He taught part of the time in the fields of social and political science at Queen's University and Glendon College, York University. He's also guest lectured at a number of other universities and contributed to books on African politics as well as televised, televised election debates. Um, almost done. You see here this is extensive uh, background, but I want to just let you know really the, the different hats that he's wearing, the academic hat as well as the media hat. Between 2006 and 2011, Amber served as the director of CWA CSA Canada, a union which represents thousands of employees and over 30 newspapers, news agencies, and broadcasters across Canada. He's also served for six years on the executive uh, board of the International Federation of Journalists, and from 2009 until 2010 was member of the IFJ's Select Committee, which examined transition issues facing traditional media around the world, uh, as well as uh, the work that led to the publication of Journalism, Unions in Touch with the Future. Amber presents uh, uh, presently is an associate of Ryerson University Center for Labor Management Relations, where he's organizing a major conference on the myriad challenges facing precarious workers in the media, cultural, and communication industries. The lecture topic that he's chosen today is free expression, the use of media in waging mass public protest, and the political realities facing those who wield power and those who seek to remove them. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Mr. Uh, Arthur Amber. Thank you. Uh, because I'm a strong proponent of free expression, I didn't yesterday, when people were speaking and actually using some of my material that I wanted to present today, try to stop them. Uh, I must say that that continued this morning. Uh, one of the few authorities I, am going to, I was going to speak about extensively happened to be Ethan Zuckerman. And Ethan Zuckerman came to Canada a little while ago at the University of British Columbia, and I happened to hear him speak uh, on subjects. It was social media meets social change, or might be verse, ver vice versa. But in any event, so some of the things that I had intended, like talk a lot about Article 19, the basis for all of this, uh, well, that was covered yesterday, and other things were covered yesterday and this morning as well. However, I'm going to change the subject and the tone of the subject completely because free expression and somebody yesterday said why are we talking about politics why don't we talk about free expression well, I'm going to talk about the challenges of free expression and the beginning of it is not going to be uh, all that gentle uh, every year at the end of the year there are groups of free expression organizations that put out the list of kills this is the number of people working in the media who got killed for doing the jobs that they are doing. Those of us who live in places like this don't expect that to happen to us. But every year, that number is around 100. Some years it's less, some years it's more. And I just want to give you, to start this off, 
just some sort of depth of this assault on people who are expressing free expression and opinion and covering news. Uh, so there are four groups that do this nicely. One is the United States uh, Committee to Protect Journalists. There's one in Paris, uh, the Reporters Without Borders, and there are two competing ones in one respect. One is the IFJ out of Brussels, and then the Publishers Group uh, is another one. But generally speaking, they're about the same numbers. So let me go back to 2011. Here's some of the countries, and some of them you wouldn't expect to have these, the, these statistics. Ten were killed in Mexico, nine in Iraq, six in Yemen, six in Pakistan, six in Honduras, five understandably in some respects in, in Libya, but five in Brazil, four in the Philippines. And let me stop about the Philippines. Two years ago in the Philippines, on one day, 38 media workers were slain, were killed as they were accompanying, somebody was going to put in their papers to run for governor of one of the states in Brazil, and they were just mowed down. Um, I only bring these to you so that you understand that to get f the fight for free expression has to go on in all countries because although I just talked about people getting killed in other countries and, and, and it, 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 the numbers according to CPJ are since 1992 that there have been 902 journalists killed around the world. So those are the hard facts, but in our own countries, the ones that were in the Western world, the fight for free expression also goes on. It, it just at a different level. For example, freedom of access to information from governments, local, in my case provincial, in other people's states, or federal. The issues of laws about contempt, the issues uh, about laws, about secrecy under the new, uh, the new regulations about security, so on and so forth. Also, the, the issue that comes up, not with government, but with the incredible uh, public relations industry, which does at time, from time to time and quite often mixes up very, very strongly with things like free expression. So this is what we are facing in the terms of what we call people whose ultimate human rights and right to freedom of expression are extinct because they are killed. But in addition to that, journalists around the world in various countries face constant intimidation from their governments, constant possibilities of arrest, beatings, torture, and or ending up getting thrown in prison on bogus charges and or not even ever actually facing trial, but there for a long, long time. So what we have here is who's doing this and how is it all happening? When it comes to the deaths, it could be the government that ordered your death, it could be a drug cartel that ordered your death, particularly in Mexico or Colombia, it could be somebody who just doesn't like you or somebody who's in some sort of business deal that happens to be slightly corrupt, but he's, he or she is going to be exposed, and they will get you killed. And the reason they're able to get you killed is because of two factors. This week, the Western world is completely consumed with the death of two Western journalists, one photographer, one reporter, in Syria last week. And you hear it. I watched the news last night. And there it was, big story. What they sometimes forget, that there was also a Syrian journalist who was killed at the same time. And the reason I bring that up is that of all these people that I just said are getting killed, it's not really foreign correspondents, except generally in conflict zones like Syria, where foreign correspondents get killed. The people that are getting killed are the people that are doing investigative stories in their countries about the conditions in their countries. And that's why this thing gets harder and harder to combat. So let me just leave that with you to understand that the fight for freedom of expression, like the fight for other rights in this world, are hard won. And people do put their lives on, uh, on the line in order to achieve that. Now, 
as you heard in my introduction, I'm the president of the Canadian Journalist for Free Expression, and we run something called IFEX, which is a very unusual name. It's the International Freedom of Expression Exchange. In 1992, there, was, there were very, very few organizations, they were all big international organizations, that were in this field, and they were competing with, with each other. Somebody at UNESCO, often criticized, got together about $50,000, brought 12 organizations to Montreal, the University of Montreal, and held a meeting and said, if you want to be more successful in what you're trying to do, do it collectively. Let's get together and do this. But there were a lot of the organizations that were really worried about this, so they said, yes, we will form something where all the activities we do will be sent to a central location and put out across the world. So for example, if we know that somebody for the sake of it in Honduras is right now being you know, hunted down by the government, we will put that out as an alert and people around the world in the organization can bring pressure on their governments or in this case on the Honduran government to make it happen. So that weird name came up. And in the first year, and then they had to decide, well, who's gonna run this? How's it gonna work? Well, to be blunt about it, uh, politics entered the question. Uh, the group in Paris and another group from France obviously did not want anybody but the French to do it. The two English groups there wanted it to be centered in England. The American groups wanted it in the United States. So in the end, the compromise was, well, let's do it in Canada. Uh, there was also in the first year the belief that this was never going to get up off the ground. But with the uh, $50,000 grant from the Rockefeller Center, uh, it did get off the ground in 1992. In that year, there were 300 of these alerts sent out. And what were these alerts to do? It was to let the international community know that there were problems going on and to take action. And that's why they're called alerts. But in addition to the, uh, the issue of 300 alerts, this has grown and grown to now it's up of a membership in the 80s. And in the other membership, there's still only about 12 international groups, and all the other groups are front-like groups, whether it be in Nigeria, or whether it be in Tibet, or where in the world, particularly in Latin America. Um, and what are we doing now? Well, here are the statistics from 19, uh, 2011. There are 40,000 visitors a month to the ifex.org website. There are over 5,000 items processed by IFEX every year. And in addition to the service which goes to all our members, we have 12,000 subscribers. So we are the organization that spends most of its time and better and more thoroughly than anybody else working on the protection of free expression across the country. What we do is we put out in addition to those things that I say in every day as alerts and what have you, is we put out a weekly digest we put out uh, something called a communique. We run various campaigns. And I'll tell you, one of the reasons why people get killed so easily is because it's always done with immunity. What I mean by immunity, impunity at least, is that if you shoot somebody in Russia, you kill somebody in the Ukraine, you knock off somebody in Mexico, the likelihood of you ever facing trial and being convicted is very, very slight. The estimation is that 95% of all journalists are killed. The people who kill them never face justice. So we have campaigns about impunity. In fact, we had a whole month about, about battling against impunity uh, last year. We also are very, very run campaigns about defamation. We ran some campaigns in Tunisia. We have groups, regional groups that take care of the of the groups within that region, Latin America, Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, so, so, so on and so forth. Moving right along, because I don't want to uh, run out of time here. So IFEX is a thriving uh, organization on which a lot of this fight is right on the battleground of uh, where freedom of expression is uh, being waged. Let me now switch because part of the title is about the Arab Spring. By now you've heard too much about the Arab Spring. Not too much because it's an unimportant 
event. But a lot of the things that I might have said to you about the Arab Spring, you've already heard. Um, I would like to add that I, um, because I heard this speech by Ethan Zuckerman, and uh, his views about the internet, or the web, as he calls it, Web 2.0, um, and the Irish Springs are very interesting. He talks about it in many ways. One of it, he uses the word cats. He says most people, unlike what we heard yesterday, where somebody says they go there for porno, and I, there was something else, but I just, the one I remember was they go there for porno. You know, all studies have shown that most people go to the internet for two things. Well, I forget what the second one was, but I know the first one was porno. Uh, Zuckerman would say that most people go there, and he used the word cats. They go there to see pictures of cats, you know, flushing a toilet, or cats jumping through a hoop, or cats. It's a, it, it's a catch-all for saying that people go to the web, to the internet, for various mundane things, everyday things, things that might interest them. If you like flowers, you go there for flowers. But what he says is that also people through the first set of internet and now web 2.0, that uh, they also have began expressing themselves in a way they never have been able to before. Because as you know, everybody has a comment about everything. And in that, you begin to change what people think about their rights to free expression. I was amazed before the word, the, the phrase Arab Spring could have even been thought of. This is about the second, third, or fourth day of the uprising in Tunisia. And the CBC is carrying on radio a story out of there. And they go to somebody and they say, so what's this all about? And the man says, it's about people want to be able to say what they say. It's freedom of expression. This is something we want. And I literally went like this, because over my years, in many countries I've been in, I've heard of people revolting because there was not enough food, prices were high, they didn't like this, they didn't like that. But rarely have I heard that one of the primary motives of something was freedom of expression. And over the weeks that passed, uh, as Zuckerman says, what happened in Tunisia was very, very closely linked with Web 2. Before the fruit dealer set himself ablaze, there were other fruit dealers who set themselves ablaze years before. And it never ended up in the beginning of the Arab Spring. The difference was when that, the family of that particular fruit dealer confronted the officials after his death, the family actually recorded it and put it on social media. And suddenly there was, there was evidence of the way, the abusive way that government was handling the common people in Tunisia. The same thing Zuckerman points out in Egypt. Uh, Rebecca talked about the, the blogger who was killed and it, the, the entire episode when the police beat him to death outside a cafe in Al Alexandria the year before. That was a very, very big motivation in, the, in what happened in Egypt. And uh, Zuckerman also says, as I do, that the people that are least able to handle a public uprising like Tunisia and Egypt are the people in power. We'll get to that in a second. But one of the things that Zuckerman says is that unbeknownst to the people in power, when briefly in Egypt they succeeded in shutting down the net, it meant people that were already in Egypt who were taken up with the fight against Mubarak didn't have to sit around at home on their computers because it, there was nothing there anymore and they went out into the streets and the crowds got bigger for those couple of days when the internet was shut down than they were before. And that leads us right to the issue of power. And the reason that I made that as part of the speech, until less you interrelate between what web is 
what the power that people have is and what power that people seek is, you don't get a full understanding. So let me go to the first key note of power. Somebody who lived many hundreds of years ago, about 300 years ago, Lord Acton made the famous saying, which most people misquote, but the direct quote is, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So I had that all prepared to put into my address today. Last night, a program I love, and whenever I get a chance to see it, I watch it, BBC's called Hard Talk. It's where some poor, usually a government person or a person in the spotlight, goes and sits down at a half hour to get interviewed and demolished by a very hard-edged journalist. Yesterday, David Milbrand, the former Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom, was on the program. And as a softball introductory question, the interviewer says, so David, you've been traveling around a lot recently. We know this because your name comes up. But it must be awfully frustrating to travel as a private citizen when you used to travel for the government. And David Milbrand says, yes, it is very frustrating. But he said, you know, everything, and there's the quote, having power itself is frustrating. However, losing power is absolutely frustrating. And I, 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 I bring it to you because the Lord Acton's point. Not everything Lord Acton said was really all that good, but that's one statement that is true. And it's true in the democracies that we live in that people who have power, whether it be in a large corporation or particularly in government, they get all sorts of things for them. Somebody opens the door of the car, someone drives the car, someone gives them access. Someone gives them the right to make decisions. Someone gives them the right to hire people. I could go on and on, and that's in our societies. In the societies where change is necessary, like in Egypt and Tunisia, the power exists at a different level. The power there was usually gained by force, and the people who gained it by force are prepared to use force to maintain it. And I think in the discussion yesterday, our colleague from Syria actually said the only way that you'll get rid of that government in Syria is through force. And I've heard this also, that people who are close uh, know about the Syrian government say that as well. And so you have to look at things. Dictators, by nature, do not resign. They do not resign r willingly. Many of them are chased out of their countries eventually, but no one wakes up one day and says, you know what, I've been doing this for 15 years. I'm just going to walk away from it. And there's a whole lot of reasons, one of which what they did in the 15 years might come back to bite them. The other thing, too, is that take Tunisia, take Egypt, even take Libya. The dictators have a habit of turning their job into a family business. In some cases, the man or woman who is running the show may have certain attributes of leadership, whether you like what he does or she does, or you don't like it, but at least you will have to admit that they have some, some token of leadership ability. Doesn't mean that that through the genes is also what their sons or daughters might have, and particularly in this case, sons. So it's a family business and you want to keep the family business going. The family business good is good because in addition to having the power, none of these dictators don't have the money and the family has the money as well. So do they know how to react? When somebody comes and says, I want more freedom, why don't you let us have a real election? They don't understand what they're talking about. So what the reaction was, you'll notice, both in Egypt and Tunisia was, I'm going to hold on. I'm here for 30 years and I intend to be here another 10 or whatever until I die maybe, and then the family will take over. So they came to power that way, that's the way they control society, and they can't understand the whole idea of relinqu relinquishing even a part of it. So those are the people who are in, in power. What about the people who seek the power? In the Arab Spring, 
It was mostly run by young people. Young people who were better educated than maybe their previous generations. There are people who have a lack of opportunity. There were people who had very few options. And there were people, and here's where, again, dictators have a big problem. What is worse than having people that I've just described is having people that I just described who also have nothing to do. There are some countries that make sure that if, that if there are problems arising on the front, that you definitely uh, make sure that there are things for people to do, busy people. In our Arab Spring, although we are inclined to talk about it breaking out across its actual success thus far of real Arab Spring of Tunisia and Egypt, my view, and these are not the views of my organization, but my view, Libya was something else altogether. It might have started that way, but without the use of uh, Western military might, uh, the story in Libya would not have ended as it, or not ended, would not have gone on the way it has and uh, to see the end of the, uh, the old regime. So in, in these things of the Arab Spring, you had this, these conditions. There is no doubt that the web and social media played extreme uh, important parts in getting these things together. I would like now to move along a little bit. Zuckerman, as Rebecca said, talks about the issue of this private internet system, i.e. Google and all the other companies. And he says that there are two parts of it. Indeed, it's a private owned on behalf of the people that use it. But he also says that it, has, it takes up public space. And he says those of us who believe in human rights and believe in freedom of expression have to impress upon the people that own the sites to allow as much public space as possible. Uh, Rebecca told a story about people going to Facebook and getting some lenience about the use of the Alexandria tape on Facebook. There's more of that that is needed. So one year later, after the revolutions, um, there's a lot of people rushing to judgment. And somehow, they seem to lack a historical um, sense. If you did study history to any great extent about certain revolutions, you will know the one in, and that when I'm talking about revolutions here, I'm talking about sort of people-led revolutions. And of course, the classic is 1848 in Paris. Well, after the 1848 revolution succeeded, there was a mess to be cleaned up. If you look at the Russian Revolution, if you look at the Civil War that led in China, if you look at all of them, but in if we even go to more modern times, before the internet, there were large masses of people in streets to change the government. Think about the Philippines about 25 years ago. Think about the orange revolutions in the Ukraine. All of them do not automatically lead from a point that there must be change and the change must come from the people being in the streets and it must happen that once the revolution succeeds, that everything's smooth sailing. In fact, almost every one of the cases I cited wasn't the case at all. There is a lot of difference between winning the revolution and then being able to turn that into what's the next stage I'm going to talk about, which is, quote, democracy. So moving along on that, I personally have a great problem when President Bush was talking about regime change and we're going to bring democracy to these countries. I wonder what he meant, uh, to quote Leonard Cohen, <laughs> the songwriter and singer. I wonder what he meant. Because democracy is limited in almost every country in the world that professes to have it one way or the other. And if you think I'm 
exaggerating. Uh, if I said to you, let's create a country that will be democratic, people right away think, if it has an election, and Jimmy Carter has gone around the world stamping elections as either free and fair or not free and fair, or free but not fair, or fair but not free, but to make a long story short, that everyone seems to get the idea that if you have an election that is basically free and fair, you then have a democratic government. Well, do you have a free and fair election, but if you don't have an administration to carry out the will of the political leaders, is that then a democracy, or does it become a unstable democracy in a very short period of time? If you don't have a justice system, is that a democracy? If you don't have a police force that lives by the law, is that a democracy? And I could go on and cite many others. I was very, very happy once when I was in Ottawa, uh, and I met a senior foreign official person, and he said, we now have added a free expression and a free media as the fifth pillar, that when we go into a country, that that's one of our demands. If we're going to give them aid, it has to be a free media as well as all these other things. Well, Zuckerman noted, if I get back to Web 2, that there are about 50 countries in the world, 50 countries in the world that block at least to some extent part of the internet. I think that right now this issue of democracy, it's better to have the election and to begin the sorting out of how you got to get to where you got to get. But to believe that it's all about the free election is stopping short of what a democracy must be. It must be stable, it must provide for its citizens, and it must certainly allow for free expression. So, I think that um, yesterday, the discussion in the evening was about how can we as journalists, for example, in the media, get involved in this cultural democracy conversation and one of the things that I found very interesting was when they started talking about two people in the same room. I'm not quite sure where a journalist gets into that mix. But there is a, a set thing about culture, about how you get people to reach agreement. It's not unheard of. It was part of it's based on a theory out of Harvard University, interest-based bargaining. So you go into a bargaining session and negotiations, call it what you will, and you know that you have these circles of interests. I walk in there, and I'm an old guy, I'm a white guy, I'm a, this kind of guy from this kind of a country, I'm this, that, and the other thing. The person sitting opposite me has, out of all those 15 things that I have as attributes, we share maybe five of them. Those two five are in the same circle. The other 10 are outside those circles. And what you do is you talk to see how many you can move from the outer circles into the inner circles. And, and this is something you should not try in your personal relationships at home. You know those ads says, don't try to do this trick at home. Only professionals can do this. <laughs> because if you do this, if, you, if you've been involved with somebody for a long time and you suddenly do this, now what, are you, what are we really like jointly? Let's draw these circles and go on and go forth. Whereas it doesn't work. But in negotiations, it does. One of the things that also is necessary to get to those points where meetings actually work, and this is where the media does have a role, is, um, is all the little meetings that go on before the big people get into that room. Nobody in Northern Ireland reached that agreement on Good Friday without 18 months of people running around and talking to both groups and testing what I just said. What are the interests? And you get, the, you get people to the point where they have two types of demands. This is what I want, but this is what I need. And when you get them to understand that the wants, some of the wants will go, and it's just about the needs 
that we can make the deal around. That's how the compromise gets to the deal. What is the role in the media in this? The role in the media is to understand a process. At right now, the level of political journalism I find in my own country to be really, really bad. Um, I'll give you an example. Two weeks ago, our, my pro our province had an economist work for, I think, 15 months, drawing up a set of proposals to reduce the debt and deficit in the province of Ontario. And he came up with, I think, 362 or 72 proposals. He submitted the report last Wednesday. On Thursday, the media was saying, where's the government response to this? Well, the government got it three days before it was made public on the Wednesday. Do you actually expect the government within, and we're talking here about a reduction of several billion dollars. Do you actually expect the government to do that? So if the media doesn't understand the process that's underway, we are getting a provincial budget next month. And they don't understand that there might be a debate and a dialogue about the various provisions, but demanding that the government give you their answer within two minutes of the report coming out is a kind of um, intemperate uh, coverage of a story that leads to more division rather than coming together. Um, my view about where we're headed and where we're going is very similar to Rebecca's with my own views about it. The only thing I share in common with all of you in this room when it comes to age is that most all of us, everybody in this room, has spent more time in this century, less time in this century than they did in the last century. We've all spent more time in the 20th century. And the reason I bring that to your attention is the 20th century was the, the century of the nation state. If you go back to 1900, there were very few countries in the world compared to the number today. And I have no idea what the number is today. I do know that I've been in the biggest in population. I've been in the biggest in size. And one day UNESCO sent me to go to a Caribbean country. It's called St. Kitts and Nevis. And they asked me to stay there a month and to train the broadcaster and to be a better broadcaster. Uh, when I arrived there, I found out that St. Kitts and Nevis uh, didn't have a public broadcaster. In fact, the broadcaster was part of the prime minister's office. And they had one vehicle that took their reporters around and it said on it, on the, the vehicle had on it, you know, office of the prime minister. And I said, well, how do we get to journalism? Da, 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 da. But the other thing that I noticed was I said to them, I knew this before I went there. At that time, I think there were 38,000 people in St. Kitts and Nevis, but it's an independent country, has a seat at the UN. And I was said to myself, gee, that's 2,000 people less that are not in one university in Toronto, but two of the largest universities in Toronto have more students than this, these countries have people. Now, I'm using that not to lambaste St. Kitts and Nevis, but just to give it as an example that in the 20th century, with the end of a lot of colonialism and a lot of other factors, there are a lot of nation states. Article 19, the one that we live and die by, the rights that the UN said that all people have the right to various forms of free expression. But it was given over to these nation states to exercise their power in regulating their citizens about how that happens until Web 2. Because now we have social media, we have the internet, we are not closed societies, there's more ability for people to do this, and there is more, more and more people who want to do it. And that's why social media is so uh, popular at the moment. So what I'm hopeful that the said 100 years from now, someone's they wouldn't be standing up here, but standing somewhere and talking about where we are. They will talk about the rights of individuals have now come to born in the, in the century 21. We are now, we have now more freedom of expression than ever before. 
but don't be, don't be negligent about it. Each and every generation has to continue the fight. When I started off, I gave you the, the, the sorry statistics. It is incredible how many papers are closed in certain countries and how they're starved out of business, how people are beaten, you know, tortured, thrown in jail, and how publications are closed. A government can close a small newspaper in a small country by just drawing its ads out of that newspaper. A government can cl close a newspaper anytime it wants in certain countries by limiting how much paper they get to print their newspaper. They could take a television station off by cutting the power to the television station. And all these devices are used because when they have power, they want to control the information and the message. And the internet is the big change that is now working away for it. So my last point to you is, like Rebecca, I'm optimistic because we are in this new territory. It can't get, it's not going to go back and get worse. One of the things I will tell you is that years ago, and my organization, Canadian Journalists for Free Expression, was started because journalists, particularly those of us from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, had a lot of assignments in Latin America. Wherever we went in Latin America, journalists were being really badly done by, killed, and some of them became our friends, and then they would be suddenly disappeared. Disappeared is another thing that happens to people. And so, at that time, there were a lot of military coups in Latin America. And suddenly over the years, no matter how imperfect those democracies are, they're not run by military governments. The same thing now with the Arab Spring. It certainly was a way to go forward in Web 2. And it seems to me that we're not going to go back, but we have to continue the fight continue to continue to go forward. Thank you. So I, th I think we have time just for a few questions, if there are any. I want to take you back to what you were discussing earlier about IFEX. Uh, as I understand it, such and such a journalist is under threat. You send out the alert to your member co members in other countries. They go to their own government and ask them to put pressure on the government that's that's threatening this journalist to stop doing that. Is that right? No, that's just one Sorry. part of it. Okay. The other part of it is you also go to your own government. Let me give you an example. One day on a Saturday, we get a report, a phone call. This is years ago. We get a phone call that there are crowds amassing outside of an activist's home. It's a Saturday. He says, what do we do? You know, we said, well, you first of all stay in the home and here's an idea worked elsewhere. Have a party. Call a bunch of people to your home because they will not go into your home and try to take you out of your house if you have 20 or 30 people there. And he says, well, the party can't go on forever. And we said, no, we'll try to get hold of someone from the Canadian government to come and get you. Now, I use this because that's something that we did. But that goes on everywhere. The, the beauty of having these international organizations is they have abilities to speak to their governments as well. So it isn't just that government. And let me go on beyond that. The, this is the way IFEX started. IFEX now has these campaigns. It has other modes of, of operation. Go way beyond letter writing, although letter writing was perfect. I remember a woman who came to Niger from Nigeria during the days when my Nigeria was in its last military government, and she'd got thrown into prison. And one day the warder in her section of the prison came and said, oh, you must have friends everywhere. Because suddenly there was a deluge of letters from all around the world to get this woman journalist out of the Nigerian prison, and she was released eventually. And so those kind of pressures were more of the past. What we're working on now is a lot more sophisticated things. For example, in Tunisia, there's the Tunisia Monitoring Group. Uh, around the world, we have something about Bahrain. The, somebody yesterday was speaking and said, you think things are, are OK. Bahrain is, is a disaster zone, and it is. And so we have a group working on that particular issue. We have many particular campaigns that I mentioned before that are, that are underway. 
Thank you. Maybe one more question, if there is any more questions in nope. the audience. This is, this is a very general question, but uh, what do you think are some of the most uh, uh, egregious threats to freedom of expression in democracies? What, where are the slippery slopes, in other words? Well, you know, over the years, we've examined the issue of the, the corporatization of the media. So yesterday, when someone was talking about Italy, they were talking about the cross-ownership of where major industrial companies also own part of the media. I think that's a threat of a different nature, but it's a threat. I think there's threats right now about various possible laws in certain countries based on what happened in 2001 on security. One of the things that somebody else said yesterday, which is true, is sometimes in these, in, in, in the new, newly developed demo, democracies, when they see that in an old democracy we pass stringent controls on, on, on security lines so that if anybody you know, ever speaks to somebody who's deemed to belong to an organization as a terrorist, becomes flagged. We're also concerned in Canada right now, uh, the Justice Minister last week said he's going to present a bill which will mean that police departments can go to the in internet providers and get your, your, your ID number from them without a judge's order. You know, right now you need a judge's order, da 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 da. And there's an incredible outcry. They're going to have to redo that because it, it, won't, it won't get through. But those are the kind of things you have to t always be out on lookout for because those are some of the threats. The other thing, too, is that the, it's important as free expression people to ask our governments to work as hard as they can on getting other countries to get aboard because you need free expression everywhere, not just in our countries as well. Talking about Arab Spring has two tracks. The first tract is researching, researching tract. But nobody talked about how to preach the uh, liberal power, liberal, etc., parties, liberal uh, culture in the West with the Arab Orient as it is liable to fundamental forwarding or fundamental, etc., religious. Uh, so we are quite, quite uh, afraid that we will lose this Arab Spring unless the uh, public, Arab, uh, public European Union will bridge the Arab Spring and to coordinate more in order to uh, re-forward this spring in order not to be lost and not to be kidnapped by fundamentality in the, in the Orient. I, I'm very glad you brought that point up. And I, and I tell you what I'm going to say now is definitely me as a person, not as the president of anything. I think uh, that the biggest cultural problem, and I take cultural in a, in a very wide scope, is this rise not by one particular religion, but nearly by all of them, major religions, you know, where the extremist elements, even in countries where they are not dominant yet, but they're pushing the conversation continually towards all sorts of restrictions on what people might do. Listening, and, and I don't want to, uh, you know, sort of uh, get get any Americans upset at me, but listening to the Republican candidates for office of the presidency and their approach about the Christian religion within the United States and all those values scares me. And it scares me when I hear what's happening in the other religions as well. And I think your point in, in every... One of the things that we definitely know, that in every country, the set of circumstances can't just fall under, quote, the Arab Spring, because the conditions in Tunisia were one kind of conditions, and that was definitely a family business. The conditions in Egypt are basically an army-controlled country. 
the conditions in Libya were more of a, from my reading, more of a tribal organization. In Syria, your point is very well taken. You made it yesterday as well. I too am, am very, very concerned about this because I think that we, if you have an example of what could happen in a theocracy, then you have to be very cautious to worry about what happens if another one succeeds like that. I don't know how to bridge it because you know what? We don't know how to bridge it in the West. The, 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 the views of democracy, even though I say that it's the various degrees of democracy in each and every country, they're based on a secular point. You know, that little clip that Rebecca showed at the end where the guy says, you know, and then she said, you know, uh, yes, the way it works, it all used to be based on I'm the king and you're not the king and I'm the king and God made me the king and my family. Well, you know what? That doesn't, <laughs> that's totally against what we need in the world in my view. And I, if I had the answer, or if anybody had the answer, they would share it with you, I'm sure. But it's the, it, it, it is a fundamental, fundamental problem. And I could tell you that, that um, I've been in countries, and I want to say this because a lot of the people in this room are not Muslim. I've been in Muslim countries. I was in Kosovo. And the people in Kosovo, quote, are Muslims. But the people in Kosovo are not, are, are not extremists about it. The, I was sent to a religious school when I was youngster. I used to call those people sir, you know, when you had to talk to them, yes sir, no sir. Now that I'm older uh, and I know more, I probably would call them extremists because it was a very tight, let me use the word orthodox, uh, conception of religion. And that is, is a cultural issue that we are going to be facing in the 21st. The internet and Web 2, I think, is beginning to show us that people's ideas are more easily transportable around the world. And Article 19 says these rights to freedom of expression have no regard for frontier. It doesn't matter what country you're in, you can send it to another country. But the issue of how to actually push back against the extremist, religious extremists, is the most difficult one right now, I think. As Arab Spring is still initiated by political powers, by Security Council, by United States, and by those crooks who never uh, feel the sense toward common people and common demonstrators. So I, I believe that the Arab Spring will one day be confiscated, seized, and detained by these West and East, Russia and the United States world powers. And I am quite worried about Arab Spring. That's to say, that is to confirm, that's to repeat. Thank you very much. Once you make the revolution and you call for elections, you better be prepared to run in those elections. One of the things that dismayed me in Egypt was when some of the people that had caused the removal of the president said, we're not going to get involved in these elections, they're phony. Well, you know what? You ha there, there's rules of every game you're in. You know, if you're playing football, the field's this big, right? If you're playing another sport, you know, the ball you throw it into the net. You have to play by the rules that the rest after the revolution is going to go on. And sometimes people say, well, look, if it isn't a completely open situation, I'm not going to participate in an election. Well, that's a problem. You know, uh, there's no doubt that religious parties in certain Arab countries have already been there. And so they are going to be well organized to win. But it's also a cultural thing because a lot of people who, just like in the United States with, quote, born again Christians, they will automatically vote for a born again person no matter what he or she stands for. These are very, very troublesome ideas. How we overcome them, I don't know, but we must, we, we must be continually to work against them. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in expressing our sincere gratitude to Mr. Arnold Ember. Thank you.